Good evening, everyone. And uh, make sure, ladies and gentlemen, that Fiveable has free reviews every week, okay? Every Wednesday. So as far as that goes, let's go ahead and see what questions we're gonna take. We've got some questions coming in. And of course, our emphasis area is World War One. okay? Now, as far as this goes, Michael, one thing that we could say about World War I affecting the American economy, okay? So let's think about, uh, first of all, you wanna remember Eugene V. Debs, okay? Eugene V. Debs, who was the socialist labor leader. Now, this is a really good uh, review of, you know, the, of, of the labor movement, okay? because we talked about Eugene Debs uh, during the Gilded Age. Of course, he was part of the Pullman strike. And then when Eugene Debs was jailed in connection with the strike, he read the Communist Man and came out of here feeling a lot different. And so Eugene V. Debs was specifically a socialist labor leader, but we don't want to mistake every labor leader for a socialist, okay? So now Eugene Debs was jailed again in 19, 1920 or during World War II, World War I, so maybe he was jailed in 19. It doesn't really matter, okay? Eugene V. Debs was jailed. So he was jailed for speaking out against the draft. So the Espionage and Sedition Acts. Uh, now let's kind of think about this. These were um, acts that outlawed anti-war speech and other activities that undermined the war effort. Now, one thing I want to, what that thing is, I'm recording a German unification rap. I thought I would wear my Germany shirt, uh, Deutschland, with the eagle on it. Now, according to the Espionage and Sedition Acts, if this would have been during World War I, I would be committing a crime by wearing this t-shirt, okay? Because I am displaying the logo, like I, I could be seen as supporting the enemy. So, you know, just like you heard about the Alien and Sedition Acts um, that were passed in 1798. So as far as that goes, Eugene V. Debs was j and especially in the sense that he was encouraging people to avoid the draft. He wasn't personally avoiding the draft, but he was uh, he was advocating avoiding the draft from jail. OK, so in 1920, he actually ran for president from jail. Now, as far as the effect on the economy, OK, what we want to what we want to note there is that the effect on the economy, you've got the social. Eugene V. Debs, but you've also got um, the American Federation of Labor, Samuel Gompers. Now, Samuel Gompers was about bread and butter unionism, and also note the American Federation of Labor, that this is, these are patriotic laborers who don't have a problem with the capitalist mode of production uh, or a market economy or anything like that, that just want a little more money. And so Samuel Gompers and the NFL, they actually banned strikes like the A assigned a pledge that they would not strike during a time of time of war. So that's something that I think is interesting as well. Now, another thing is that the Ford Motor Company, for example, the Model T had really taken off during the 19 teens. And once it gets to the uh, you know, to the war, then the Ford factories are converted to war production. OK, if the audio is good, then we'll just go ahead and go that okay so we just go ahead and uh you know just i'm going to turn the video off we're going to keep the audio going we're going to see what happens there okay so as far as that goes we're finished answering that one now the topic i would like to know more about would be the harlem okay audio is still awful okay skipping audio seems okay well i'm going to keep going i'm going to keep going and uh, again sorry about the situation here audio's fine now okay good good i think we found something we can keep doing it okay all right so let me know if there are any other problems but i think we're going to be good here okay so let's okay you can understand it all right good deal good deal all right so as far as that the harlem hellfighters okay so the harlem hellfighters um were an african-american military regiment and you really need to know more about their contributions to world war one than world war two okay so as far as uh, as far as that goes 
World War One and, you know, World War One mainly. Now, the thing is, we want to go through there and note that now during the American Civil War, uh, black soldiers were put into to segregated units led by white officers. Um, there were some that actually saw combat. OK, but we want to note that during World War One, African-American soldiers, uh, you know, 380,000 African-Americans ser served, but were strict, were restricted to non-combat roles. Um, there were a lot of white soldiers at the time who refused to serve in their units uh, alongside color, colored soldiers. And so these, uh, these regiments are made at that time that these regiments are made and they're mostly on labor details. You see that these guys are, uh, you know, they've got shovels and pickaxes and hammers. And so they're working as stevedores, as supply people. You can see that they're unloading trains. Um, as far as that goes now, John J. Pershing, um, who was the commander of the American Expeditionary Force, he was known as Blackjack. He had actually been a commander of a unit of Buffalo soldiers uh, during the Spanish-American War. And so the thing is, this gives us an interesting POV here, because in 1898, when he was uh, when he was commanding this regiment of Buffalo soldiers, he said, we officers could have taken our black heroes into our arms. They had fought their way into our affections as they have fought their way into the hearts of the American people. So he's got uh, you know, this all black 10th U.S. Cavalry Regiment. Now, of course, he is uh, you know, he's bragging on his own troops here and they've won a battle. Now, when we get to World War One, OK, same guy, John Pershing, um, 20 years later. Now, note here that this is a secret communication concerning black American troops to the French military. OK, so whereas this is reporting about the conduct of his own unit, uh, this is kind of a primer for French officers who are hearing, oh, by the way, Americans tend to be a bit racist. OK, so um, he sends this to the French army officers and says we must prevent the rise of any pronounced degree of intimacy between French officers and black officers. We may be courteous and amiable with the last, but we can't deal with them on the same plane as white American officers without deeply wounding the latter. We must not eat with them, must not shake hands with them, seek to talk to them, or to meet with them outside the requirements of military service. Now, what you could say here, did, did John J. Pershing's views on race change personally? Probably not. You think about that his purpose here as the commander in chief of the American Expeditionary Force, he's trying to keep everybody, uh, you know, for just keeping people calm and making sure there's not controversy. So he's really talking to these uh, to these French officers to try to explain to them American customs. But it's an interesting, uh, definitely an interesting pair of documents here when we think about the different points of view. Now, the Harlem Hellfighters that you asked about, the 369th Infantry Regiment. Now, the Harlem Hellfighters saw combat, but they did so under the French flag. By this time, by the time the United States troops got to the front was really about 1918. By the, you know, we entered the war in 1917, but as far as <clears throat> As far as actually getting there and fighting, this is 1918. And by that time, a lot of French units are mutinying. They're refusing to fight. Uh, they're really war weary. So they put this uh, this infantry regiment on the front lines. And here you can see a picture of the Harlem Hellfighters. And they are wearing uh, French military decorations, the, the Croix de Guerre. Uh, so they're not even being awarded with American combat decorations. So in some some ways, if you think about it, it's like, okay, you've got uh, black units uh, led by black officers, uh, maybe a step up from the Civil War in that sense. But at the same time, you still have segregated units. And then there's a step back, really, that when you see that these uh, that these soldiers are not being allowed to fight unless they're fighting under the flag of another country. Uh, this is really the low point of, uh, you know, of racism in America, this turn of the 20th century. This is about the same time as Booker T. Washington, W.E.B. Du Bois. Uh, of course, uh, you had uh, 
you know, let's see, um, you know, all of the, let's see, I'm trying, I remember it any other, any other time. Um, Ida B. Wells, yes, Ida B. Wells and the lynching epidemic that's going on at this time, really through the 1920s. Of course, it's the 1920s that you see the rise of the second Ku Klux Klan. All right. So as far as that, uh, as that goes, we've got that one. All right. Now that's, uh, what, what a, what a great, uh, thing here. Um, let's see. Hello, Kathy. Thanks for joining us from Hawaii. And again, those of you who are joining us, uh, I'm at another location and the camera wasn't working so well. So I've got audio only so that we've got uh, you know, good audio and everybody can hear me. Um, so as far as that goes, now we're asking, did World War I help or hurt the labor movement? Now, the thing is that, uh, you know, when you look at it on one hand, like I said, you've got Eugene V. Debs and people with him that were striking during the war. Now, that certainly didn't help things. Uh, but then Samuel Golfers during the war, of course, uh, you know, was patriotic and said that we're not going to strike. Now, after the war, um, there were some strikes. OK, now now one thing that's that's kind of interesting because because it's Calvin Coolidge who will later be president of the United States, but um, the Boston police strike of 1919. So as far as that goes, uh, what we see what we see here is World War One and World War Two are actually both, uh, you know, the products. Uh, I mean, they both result in kind of a step back for labor later because they're both followed by uh, a lot of strikes. And when there are a lot of strikes, people tend to uh, tend the people tend to react badly. OK, they, they're not crazy about it uh, when labor unions are overplaying their hand and as the people would see it striking too much. And so as far as that goes, uh, in 1919, you had the Boston police strike, okay, which the Boston Police Department went on strike. And of course, we see this as also during the first Red Scare. And so as far as that goes, Calvin Coolidge mobilized, you can see here, Governor Calvin Coolidge inspects the militia during the Boston police strike of 1919. So he brought, uh, he brought in the uh, the state guard and then you know we see here that now as far as that goes that in 1920 because of his performance here I mean basically Calvin Coolidge came down on the side of law and order and the thing is that we kind of see a precedent uh, a precedent here now you know Gompers Samuel Gompers was actually backing this Boston police strike uh, once the once it's uh, once the war's over all bets are off um, but Coolidge then becomes the vice presidential candidate on the 1920 Republican ticket. Now, World War II is also followed by a lot of strikes, and that's uh, really kind of the source of the Taft-Hartley Act. Uh, and that's, of course, after World War II. That'd be interesting. Sometime between uh, now and the exam, we do one of our cram sessions. Remember, go to fiveable.me for cram sessions. I'll go over the history of American labor. And the Taft-Hartley Act is a piece of congressional legislation, 1947, that basically rolled back some of the things that, you know, the Great Depression. So if we're thinking about it, um, the, the Gilded Age, terrible time for unions. The Progressive Era, more pro-union. The 1920s, walking that back a little bit. Uh, the Great Depression, very, very pro-union. And then, of course, after World War II, we see that the Taft-Hartley Act passes, which gives states the authority, like if you've ever heard of a right-to-work state, a lot of y'all live in right-to-work states. Uh, let's see, right to, yeah, so right-to-work laws. Uh, these are basically states that say that nobody can be forced to join a union. And here's a map here. You know, you can see that right-to-work states are very prominent in the South. Uh, of course, the, uh, you know, in the Rust Belt here, this has been very recent that Michigan and Wisconsin and Indiana and Iowa, um, because Republican administrations have come in in the uh, in the Midwest. Uh, generally, labor unions tend to back, you know, especially if you take AP government in the 20th century, tend to back Democratic candidates. Uh, so as far as that goes, uh, that would be just a bit of something about the labor movement. But know that during the 1920s, there was definitely um, some walking back with the uh, definitely some walking back of the progressive era um, stuff there. All right. So what is the difference between World War One and World War Two? OK, I don't even know where to begin. All right. Now, first of all, World War One started in 1914 and ended in 1918. World War Two 
started in 1939 and 1945. Now, the thing is, when we think about it, we need to think when we're doing LEQs, similarities and differences, okay? Similarities and differences. So you want to think of the similarities as well, but in both cases, the United States was not very quick to intervene in that war. It took a couple years. Uh, of course, in World War II, it took the United States getting attacked by Japan. But at the same time, the United States was very, uh, you know, was very hesitant to get involved in both. Now, a big difference would be the mobilization um, after the war. OK, so after. Oh, wow. OK, well, that would be something. Megan, you want to you want to spend a little time on YouTube. It sounds like LEQ is a long essay question. Basically, you get an essay prompt and you uh, and you'll write it now. But as far as that goes, that after World War One, we saw the 14 points with Woodrow Wilson um, going for, you know, wanting uh, disarmament, you know, reduction of arms because the arms buildup had been seen as a cause of World War One. Now, as far as World War Two, we see the beginning of the Cold War. So there is a continued mobilization of U.S. military forces really for the first time. It's uh, it's going to be for the first time uh, that that's that that's ever happened, that the United States has kept a large military presence, not in wartime because of the threat of communism. Now, another thing here would be the first Red Scare versus the second Red Scare. OK, so the first Red Scare, of course, about, uh, you know, is about radical immigrants. The second Red Scare um, targeted more toward communists in general and especially communists who were perceived to um, have infiltrated the State Department, which some did. It's just a matter of now McCarthyism was about accusing people whether they had evidence or not. But one case you might want to look at is the Alger his case, uh, which was, uh, you know, was a case where they got him for, uh, you know, for perjury. But he was probably, you know, there seems to be a consensus now that he probably was working for the Soviets in some capacity or passing information. All right. So as far as that, as uh, far as that goes. All right. So what are the reasons different countries joined World War One? OK, so let's uh, let's think about this now, Megan. One thing I'll, I'll note here is that I will be broadcasting again at 9 p.m. for AP Euro. But y'all are more than likely y'all are or, I mean, y'all are more than ha more than welcome to join us for the AP Euro broadcast, because I'm going to be getting probably a little bit more into the causes of World War One. OK, so I don't want to completely replicate that broadcast. Um, but yeah, somebody will always bring up those main causes of World War One, military, militarism, alliances, imperialism and nationalism. Now, as far as that goes, the United States was not in on the alliance system. So you see all of these European alliances, but we go back to Washington's farewell address and Washington's farewell address. It was like, let's stay out of all of these permanent alliances. OK, so that's the old Washingtonian Jeffersonian foreign policy that the United States is not going to be involved in an alliance. Now, the other thing here that we want to note here is that Americans tended to be divided in their sympathies based on where they were born. So native born Americans, Greek and Russian immigrants would have a preference for the allies, whereas German and Austrian immigrants, uh, you know, which uh, if you live in the Midwest, uh, there is a lot of German uh, immigration there. So Germany is actually when you separate England, Scotland, and Ireland, then you see like British Isles would be the biggest source of immigration and, and American heritage and ancestry. But when you separate the British Isles, then German is the number one pro professed heritage of Americans today. So we stay out of it. Okay, going again back to Washington's farewell address. Uh, it is our true policy to steer clear of permanent alliances with any portion of the foreign world. So at first, the United States doesn't get involved because we've never gotten involved in a European war before. And that's seen as something that's not really something we want to get into. Now, as far as the provocations. All right. When we think about the provocations, when I when I made this uh, this slideshow, uh, my daughter was about three years old and we were watching a lot of Dora the Explorer. Some of y'all watch Dora. Come on. Really? Right. I mean, don't don't act like you didn't. And so I think about like the map. And when we think about where are we going? World War One. All right. So when I think about that, how did we get to World War One? OK. And the map shows us cruise ship telegram submarine. 
Say it with me. Cruise ship, telegram, submarine. One more time. Cruise ship, telegram, submarine. Now, the Germans uh, you know, use these U-boats, these underwater boats. Now, notice here that the German U-boats, they, they were submarines in the sense that they could go underwater, but they would have to surface to attack, okay? So, they would have to surface in order to attack. And so, what happened in 1915, we have the sinking of the Lusitania, which was a British luxury liner, but it had 128 Americans on board. Now, one other thing we want to note that it had on board was also uh, some uh, some armaments and ammunition and stuff like that. The Germans weren't stupid, okay? So anybody trying to portray this as just some kind of vicious attack by the Germans on a civilian vessel. Now, of course, that was the British propaganda, right? That the Germans fired upon this cruise ship, but at the same time, they were getting stuff from the United States and bringing it back on this cruise ship, uh, thinking that the Germans weren't going to fire upon it. Now, of course, that opens up another thing. We get to the 1930s and the Nye Report and American then the Neutrality Acts, because what we're going to see from there with the Neutrality Acts um, is that, you know, Americans look back in the 1930s and they're like, we, uh, you know, our arms industry got us involved in that. Now, the Lusitania is a provocation, but it did not result in us getting involved, okay? Now, part of that, you know, when you look at this, that travelers intending to, now this is a message from the Imperial German Embassy, okay? Travelers intending to embark on the Atlantic voyage are reminded that a state of war exists between Germany or allies and Great Britain and her allies that the zone of war includes the waters adjacent to the British Isles, that in accordance with formal notice given by the Imperial German government, vessels flying the flag of Great Britain or any of her allies are liable to destruction in those waters, and that travelers sailing in the war zone on the ships of Great Britain or her allies do so at their own risk. Now, is it sad that 120 or so Americans were on that ship? Yes, but at the same time, after getting formal notice, um, sometimes you got to chalk up some of this stuff to Darwinism. It's nothing really worth going to war over. Uh, that certainly it's a tragedy, but is the United States going to be pulled into a war um, because of a cruise ship that was flying the British flag that happened to have Americans on board? So it really was not a... Uh, it was not something that was a, a direct attack on the United States. And Wilson once wrote, I came from the South and I know what war is, for I've seen its wreckage and terrible ruin. So, you know, Wilson, you see over and over again, even with the 14 points, that Wilson wants to avoid war. And so we see here that instead of declaring war, there's Uncle Sam going in there and giving the Kaiser a letter, a stern warning, right, that uh, we don't want you attacking any of the ships. And Germany then says that we're not going to engage in unrestricted submarine warfare. So that keeps the United States out of the war. And in 1916, Woodrow Wilson uh, runs on the runs with one, one of his slogans is he kept us out of war. And so you see Woodrow Wilson had a had a pretty good victory there. Uh, you know, a very slight victory. Now, of course, uh, you know, that could be the, the minor party, uh, probably the Socialist Party there that they haven't put on there. Eugene Debs is running for president over and over again around this time. Now, this was an ad that caused a lot of controversy about uh, 10 years ago or so, I think, uh, that uh, this ad was an absolute vodka ad in Mexico that was basically like, hey, in an absolute or perfect world, uh, then the United States wouldn't have taken all this land. And some people are pretty bitter about that. And I mean, they may have a reason to be. But what happened here is the Zimmerman telegram or the Zimmerman note. Now, when we look at the Zimmerman note, that was a telegram from Germany to Mexico. And so what uh, what happened here was basically that Germany said that if the United States gets involved in the war, uh, if the United States gets involved in the war, then if Mexico will attack the United States, Germany will provide some assistance. And Germany was saying, we'll make sure you get back Texas, New Mexico, and Arizona. And so as far as that goes, uh, this is something that Mexico ended up not doing it okay now of course this was also like smuggled by the uh by the british uh you know it was intercepted by the british that's how we found out we found out about it but 
as far as that goes, Mexico did not agree to this. Okay, Mexico did not agree to it. But for one thing, the United States is not happy that Germany has really now this is an act of aggression against the United States to tell another country, to tell our immediate neighbor um, that at that time wasn't on great terms with us. Uh, Woodrow Wilson had sent troops uh, against Pancho Villa, who was raiding into the United States at that time. So telling a neighbor of ours to attack us, that didn't sit well. Now, the other thing here is to note that they are going to begin on the 1st of February, unrestricted submarine warfare. Okay, so that's the other thing. Okay, so when we think about it, cruise ship, telegram, submarine. Okay, now these are both kind of part of the Zimmerman telegram or Zimmerman note, but they're two separate provocations. So first of all, there was the Lusitania, which didn't get Wilson to get us into war, but there were some like Teddy Roosevelt, who was in retirement at that time, but still pretty outspoken. There were some Americans that wanted to get involved in the war after the Lusitania, but it was the Zimmerman telegram with its provocation uh, to try to get Mexico to invade. And of course, the unrestricted submarine warfare um, that leads to Wilson's war message. OK, so when we think about the most direct cause, OK, and when we're talking about causes of wars, whether it be the Revolutionary War, the Civil War, uh, you know, Wilson's war, you know, World War One, uh, there are typically going to be, you know, some underlying causes, but then the direct cause. OK, the direct cause here, Germany's policy of unrestricted submarine warfare. So Wilson and his war message puts out a national interest uh, because we have a, a national interest in navigating the seas. Now, what war does that sound like a little bit? Let's think about it. Doom, 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 doom. All right. So as far as that goes, if you're thinking the War of 1812, excellent, because the War of 1812, you think about the British impressment. And so Woodrow Wilson saying this policy of unrestricted submarine warfare is, uh, you know, is unacceptable to the United States. Now, then, and Wilson, of course, this goes along with his moral or missionary diplomacy that Wilson is a, you know, he wants to, he's an idealist. He wants to help democracy. So he says that while we're over there, we're going to make the world safe for democracy. So when Wilson talks about a purpose of World War I as making the world safe for democracy, that is consistent with his so-called missionary diplomacy. All right, so let's go and see what our next uh, popular question is. Okay, we're done answering that one. And so there have been five who had not held uh, popular generals, but two uh, were not. Some of the pros and cons. Uh, now, that one's one of those things that I'm not going to, this one's not, uh, there's not a high degree of relevance to the AP exam, um, but I'd love to talk to you about that sometime. All right, so we've just done this one, okay, with World War I. Oh my goodness, sorry to offend you, sorry to offend you. Uh, but at the same time, now one thing that I would that I would note that might make it at least a little bit relevant, um, if we think in terms of populism, okay, that when it comes down to it, an outsider may be more likely um, to try to, uh, you know, directly, you know, they're coming from outside the political culture. That tends to be the charm of an outsider is thinking in terms of this person is not part of the political establishment and maybe the They'll do something like when you think about Eisenhower, uh, that Eisenhower was, uh, you know, he was someone who was a military guy, not really a politician. And on his way out of office, you know, he said something that during the Cold War was seen as a little bit, whoa, you're, you're saying we need to dial it back uh, when he talked about the military industrial complex. All right. So as far as that goes now, Daisy, I would say that the most important part of Warren G. Harding's presidency uh, would be his campaign. OK, now, one thing that just just something for you to remember for yourself here that this is something that I thought was uh, was kind of cool that Woodrow Wilson actually used the America first slogan when he ran for re-election. Uh, when he was saying he kept us out of war, <clears throat> there were actually Woodrow Wilson advertisements that said America first. But for the purposes of a push, that's the main thing like Warren G. Harding is reacting to the failure of the League of Nations, which we want to make sure to address here tonight, um, that when it comes down to it, ran his uh, front porch campaign. Um, and let's see, yes, yeah, so the foreign, the foreign policy here, 
let's see. Actually, I might have pulled up the wrong. Okay, foreign policy is here. Yes. Okay. So, um, yes. Okay. So, as far as Warren G. Harding, his America First foreign policy. Now, that may sound familiar because President Trump uses the same term. He uses the term America First, which, of course, that was used by Woodrow Wilson. Now it's being used by Harding. And so, as far as that goes, that after the uh, debate about the Versailles Treaty, okay, the debate about the Treaty of Versailles, that one of the things was that Woodrow Wilson, now Teddy Roosevelt's big stick foreign policy was very nationalistic about, uh, you know, about further the interest of the United States, whereas Woodrow Wilson was more of an internationalist, okay, more somebody that thought that the United States should do what's best for the world, we should do what we want to do to expand democracy. And so when Harding took, uh, took office or was campaigning, he said, call it the selfishness of nationality, if you will. I think it's an inspiration of patriotic devotion to safeguard America first, to stabilize America first, to prosper America first, to think of America first first. Let the internationalist, which he's talking about Woodrow Wilson. Hey, good to see you, man. See you All right. Man. Yes, Coffee I'm a, okay. Corey Stone, everybody. Yes, All right. And the Bolshevists destroy, re, we proclaim Americanism. Okay. So by the internationalist, he's talking about Woodrow Wilson and people who wanted the United States to join the League of Nations. And so now note here, though, it says America first, not America only. Okay. So the thing is, the United States never joined the League of Nations, but there are some people that if they say that the United States foreign policy was completely quote unquote isolationist. George W. Bush said that a few years back. But at the same time, isolationism really doesn't describe what was going on, okay? Because America actually took um, a leadership role, okay? And Calvin Coolidge in 1925 in his inaugural address um, basically says that we want it to stay away from isolation. We want to stay away from entanglement. Uh, we don't want to be pacifist or militaristic. He's going for some balance here. And so there are three things that uh, we see in American foreign policy at that time, the Washington Naval Conference, the Dawes Plan, and the Kellogg-Briand Pact. Now, all three of these, okay, all three of these, America is acting not just as a participant, but a leader. And so when we think about Wilson's 14 points reduction of arms, well, the United States has taken a leadership role with this Washington Naval Conference. Other countries are coming to Washington. So, you know, the United States is active in the 20s, but on its own terms, okay? So it was decided that Britain would have, for every five ships Britain had, the United States would have five ships. Japan would have three because Japan only has a one ocean Navy. Now, Japan lobbied for three instead of two and a half because that way they were already thinking in terms, what if we had to destroy the American uh, Pacific fleet? Um, so as far as that goes, the USS South Carolina, um, you know, as ship named after my home state, that was the first dreadnought uh, that was ever uh, constructed for the United States. And in 1924, it was dismantled. So we see that the United States has, you know, really, um, as far as the first arms control treaty that I really know about here, kind of a predecessor to SALT 1, SALT 2, that sort of thing. Now, then the Dawes Plan. Now, remember, you want to differentiate this from the Dawes Act in 1887, which applied to Native Americans. OK, so uh, as far as that goes, the United States, Germany was struggling to pay the allies their reparations, whereas the allies were, by, were also struggling to pay the United States on some debts that they owed. So really the Dawes plan is a big money laundering operation that everybody, so Germany gets 2.5 billion, they send 2 billion in reparations payments. Now keep in mind though, they still owe the United States money, um, maybe on better terms, but they are still indebted, just not to the allies. And the United States receives its war debt payments. So Dawes uh, you know, won a Nobel Prize for this. Uh, the Nazis weren't too appreciative, but then again, what do they appreciate? Um, but at the same time, by the end of the 1920s, due to the Dawes plan, uh, the Germans are in debt more to the United States than they are to um, to the European allies. And then finally, the Kellogg-Briand Pact. We can all laugh for just a little bit. Now note, it's named after the United States Secretary of State 
and after the French uh, foreign minister. Okay, so the United States was taking a leadership role here. The kellogg briand Pact renounced war as an instrument of national policy. So the thing is, by the end of the 1920s, it seems like the, even without the United States joining the League of Nations, um, that we see that the 14 points are really being implemented uh, you know, quite well in the 1920s. Now, another thing about Harding's presidency would be uh, the Teapot Dome scandal. That's something that had to do with Let's see, FBI watch that. What's that? Okay, so as far as uh, as far as that goes, oh, got it, got it, got it. So as far as that goes, yeah, don't uh, don't send the FBI after me. Come on. So the key points Harding's present teapot dome scandal that would be something, but that really didn't break until after Harding died. But that was about the misuse of federal lands. Uh, the Secretary of the Interior had to resign over it. All right. Uh, so why did, let's see, why did many people not know about the war? I'm not sure where you're going with that one, Nancy. Not quite sure where you're going with that. All right. Um, contributing to Germany's decision. Um, so Brandon, yes, as far as that goes, that there was really kind of a stalemate in Europe before the United States got involved. And so when you're looking at a, you know, when you're looking at a, at a stalemate, <clears throat> Uh, then when somebody else comes in, the United States all of a sudden brings like fresh troops, like with morale, like the kind of morale that the European troops had in 1914, 1915. So the United States has all these enthusiastic troops. Also, what we want to remember here is that at this time, the United States was the largest industrial power in the world. And so Germany was second, Britain was third. And so as far as that, uh, as far as that goes, uh, what we're seeing, what we're seeing there is that when the you know, number one industrialized country gets involved, that makes a big difference as well. Now, another thing, though, that we want to note is that uh, that Allied troops never reached German soil, that when Germans agreed to the armistice, they were the lines were still in France. All right. So as far as that, uh, as far as that goes, um, let's see. Now, I'm not finding the question that really needs to be asked. OK, so I'm going to go ahead and uh, and tell you here what you need to know um, rather than what you want to know. OK, yeah, let me answer Sherman's question real quick. Um, you know, a hypothetical. Uh, what might have the U.S. involvement been in World War One if Teddy Roosevelt had been president? Well, the thing is, the president does have a role in, you know, delivering a war message. But remember, it is Congress that decides to go to war. And one of the things about World War One, and that's something I want to look into a little bit more on my own time, uh, is the anti-war movement uh, during that time. World War One actually got like, I think, a lower vote, a much uh, lower rate of support in Congress. Now, it did get a majority, but let's see. So uh, World War One Declaration of War. Congress. Okay, so let me just uh, let me go in here real quick and take a look here. That uh, let's see, congressional. Okay, so the United States declaration of war on Germany in 1917. So the votes here um, in the Senate, the resolution passed 82 to six. Um, and then in the House, 373 to 50. Now that's pretty substantial, but at the same time, when you look at uh, when you look at uh, at that going on, that uh, that's still about one in seven uh, members of Congress opposed it. So with now that's, of course, with the Zimmerman telegram and unrestricted submarine warfare. So I don't know if Roosevelt would have been able to get a uh, congressional declaration of war, especially at that time with the Democratic Congress. But that was a good question. Interesting. All right. So as far as that, uh, far as that goes now, one thing that I would note here, massacres of innocents like those in World War II and World War I, um, not so much. OK, as far as that goes, not not so much there. But at the same time, that doesn't mean that we can't pretend. OK, so part of the propaganda campaign. OK, so I'm going to get into uh, I'm going to get into some things that you really need to know here uh, because uh, people aren't asking the right questions. I don't know if anybody seen iRobot where that guy's like, you're not asking the right questions. And so as far as that goes, the propaganda campaign. Now, first of all, we want to note now another thing that the Selective Service Act, there are four drafts in U.S. history, Civil War, World War I, World War II, and Vietnam. So the world wars are in the middle of the four drafts. Now, the propaganda campaign, okay, so what we're looking at here is recruitment, war financing, 
conserve resources and dehumanize the enemy. Now, when you ask about the war economy, uh, conserving resources was a voluntary thing, okay? So the government didn't take over on um, the economy in terms of production and consumption like we see during World War II. But recruit soldiers, sailors, and nurses finance the war, conserve resources, and dehumanize the enemy. Now, when we look here, we see that uh, this is asking people to enlist. This is appeal appealing to your sense of manhood, right? That you are, uh, you know, you don't want to be on that side of the window. You want to be on the outside of the window. Now, note here that this is trying to get enlistments, but it's also dehumanizing the enemy. Now, this is something that was some kind of story that somebody told, and it's like this woman was crucified. And so Americans would be told of all of these terrible atrocities um, that the Germans or the Huns, because Austria-Hungary get it, even though, you know, they're pulling up this imagery of like Attila the Hun in the late Roman Empire. And so then, if you're crazy, join the tanks, treat them rough. If you're not so crazy, uh, maybe you might want to join the Navy, okay? If you're not so crazy, you might want to join the Navy. And so as far as that, uh, as far as that goes, uh, then we see, you know, job skills, stuff like that. Uh, then another appeal to your manhood that, gee, I wish I were a man, I'd join the Navy. Now, at this time, women were still not allowed to join the armed forces. They could sign up as nurses, but they could not, uh, they could not join the armed forces. And then I love this one, even a dog enlists. Why not you? And so then you can see that women were, you know, were told, hey, I mean, we can train you as a nurse or the Red Cross needs people to knit socks. Another thing we want to make sure that we've got is that the 19th Amendment, there is a direct causal relationship between World War I and the 19th Amendment, which was, uh, if you want to remember it, it was sent to the states for ratification in 1919. It was actually ratified in 1920. Now, this was a long time coming. This goes all the way back to the Seneca Falls Convention in 1848. So a long time coming, about 70 years there, if I'm counting right. Uh, so then we see here liberty bonds. So if you're an older man, okay, so young men need to enlist. Older men need to uh, need to buy bonds. And so we see the little girl. My daddy bought me a government bond of the third liberty loan. Did yours. And so then we see his Liberty bond paid for in full. All right. And so then also conserve, okay, conserve resources. Now, during World War I, completely voluntary. Sign your country's pledge to save food. We want to save meat and wheat, okay? Meat and wheat. And so as far as that goes, these voluntary appeals to eat cottage cheese, plan a victory garden, um, sheep clubs. If you want to shear sheep sheep and give the wool to the war effort, Woodrow Wilson actually grazed sheep on the White House lawn. Um, and then, of course, dehumanizing the enemy, beat back the Hun with liberty bonds. Now, this, of course, what you see here is these uh, these posters, they make it look like the Germans are coming for you. All right. So that's something like to make Americans feel like they were in danger when really this is one of those wars where they're looking back at it. There's not there wasn't a serious danger to the United States of America. And when we talk about American neutrality in the 1930s, we'll see that there was a good bit of buyer's remorse for getting involved in this war. Uh, the United States made more war propaganda in two years than any other country did in four years. And so you can see here buy a liberty bonds so that you can finance the war and keep this German man from killing a woman and her child. Okay, so good question about the atrocities. It's really more perceived atrocities at this time. And did I, was I actually, okay, so I think I was answering a question there. So we go into the, uh, into the propaganda. All right, so as far as that goes, um, one thing that I would, uh, one thing that I would note here, let's see, the, a major cause of death. Now, Kate, we would note that World War I was the, um, the only war between countries where poison gas was used, okay? So that's, uh, that's something that, you know, is something you can take home with you, noting that that poison gas technology. All right, so then what we need to get into is the Versailles Treaty debate, okay? So I don't see any questions about 
about this, but it's something that is very, very important, okay? Um, so as far as that goes, let's go ahead and uh, get and uh, take a look at that because that's going to be something that's really important, even though no one's asking about it. I think this is critical to understanding World War One and where foreign policy is going. So now I've got a video about this as well. If you go to my YouTube channel, YouTube slash Tom Ritchie, uh, then you'll find you or you can search for Wilson versus the Senate. OK, that's going to be on my YouTube channel. It's really it was I, I made that video in like the first uh in the first year of my channel. So as far as that goes, I think that goes back to like 2013 or so. So the Versailles Treaty controversy, okay, now in AP Euro, we'll focus more directly on the 14 points, okay, so there were five principles that worked there with the 14 points, freedom of the seas, reduction of arms, open treaty negotiations, self-determination of peoples, and the League of Nations. Now, all five of these were addressing a cause of the war. A lot of people called World War I the war to end all wars. They were hoping that this would be, this would get war over with, and especially number five, Woodrow Wilson's most ambitious idea of having a League of Nations, okay, that we have a League of Nations that gets together um, in a formal forum for international discussion. And so going with that, what Woodrow Wilson was hoping for was a peace without victory, so to speak. Now, in order to get Germany to agree to the armistice, then they were dropping the 14 points out of planes, shooting them out of cannon. And so Woodrow Wilson was trying to get everybody to the peace table um, to say, hey, let's actually make a treaty based on the 14 points. Now, of course, France and Britain weren't as crazy about that as the United States. You see, for every uh, two soldier, two American soldiers you, that died, you had 16 Brits and 25 Frenchmen. The United States was even a larger country. So as far as that goes, Woodrow Wilson kind of finds himself, uh, finds himself alone there. Um, the Prime Minister of Britain um, said, I was seated between Jesus Christ and Napoleon. He's talking about Woodrow Wilson and Clemenceau from France. OK, so uh, Richard Hofstetter is a historian. He wrote the American political tradition, which that's a book. Uh, you know, maybe our, our intern can put that uh, a link to Amazon or something like that into the chat. Um, Richard Hofstetter's book, it's called The American Political Tradition. Uh, that is a book that if you're really serious about getting a five, I think it's a great book to read if you're if you'd actually be willing to read a book. But uh, Clemenceau from France, he wanted blood. And so basically, they put in they put the 14 points into the treaty it actually let off with it now y'all wouldn't need to know article 231 for the a push exam but the treaty itself ended up being a series of compromises uh, then it also punished germany and austria hungary now this was actually though Woodrow Wilson's self-determination of peoples that were basically going to uh, take land from Germany and were going to cut up Austria-Hungary into all of these smaller ethnic states. And so as far as that goes, we see that Germany ceded territory, Austria-Hungary has been cut up. And so he brings this treaty back. And of course, it includes the League of Nations, okay? But the thing is that treaties have to be ratified by the United States Senate. And not just by a majority, but it must be uh, two thirds of the senators. OK, so the president has the power to make treaties, but with the advice and consent of the Senate. So two thirds of the Senate has to vote to ratify a treaty. Wilson was pretty arrogant throughout this whole thing. OK, so no senators were included in Wilson's peace delegation to Europe. And so as far as that goes, in 1918, the Republicans uh, took over the Senate. So Wilson is dealing with a Senate that the other party has control of, and it's also controlled by people who have a different view of foreign policy than he does. And so as far as this goes, you've got a Republican majority, and the League of Nations is the biggest problem with this treaty, because Article 10 says here, the members of the League undertake to respect and preserve as against external Internal aggression, the territorial integrity, and existing political independence of all the members of the League. In case of any such aggression, or in case of any threat or danger of such aggression, the Council shall advise upon the means 
by which this obligation shall be fulfilled. Now, we see the word obligation. There were a lot of people in the Senate that did not like this, okay? Because what they saw was that if we get involved in this, then could the United States be brought into a war without the consent of the US Congress? And so the Republican controlled Senate, they weren't very happy about this. Now, if you think about the ratification of the Constitution, that there were the Federalists and the Anti-Federalists, but the Anti-Federalists were divided into like, we want the ones who were the hardliners who we think the Constitution is just bad, bad, bad. And then the more moderate Anti-Federalists that said, if the Constitution has a Bill of Rights, I'm cool with it. And it's similar here that Wilson's faction, the Internationalist, which made up of mostly Democrats, uh, most of the Democrats uh, sided with him here, uh, that ratify the treaty as is, okay? Don't make any changes to the treaty. Now, then you have the reservationist who said, let's ratify the treaty with reservations. Like we're basically gonna put an asterisk after certain sections of the treaty. And note that we're not going, that it's going, the, the United States only goes to war by the consent of the US Congress. And then finally, there were the irreconcilables. Don't ratify the treaty at all. Um, and so when we think about sovereignty here, okay, sovereignty being that the United States, are we going to have the, uh, the authority to control our own foreign policy? And this is kind of what's leading to the election of, uh, you know, Warren G. Harding in the 1920s foreign policy, that as far as that goes, now the irreconcilables, what you can see here, no entangling alliances, okay, which entangling alliances, a lot of people think that comes from Washington, that was actually Jefferson, but no entangling alliances upon which the strength of this republic has been founded. And so William Borah represents this, this irreconcilable faction, a lot of whom were champions of this Washingtonian, Jeffersonian foreign policy, uh, you know, what some people refer to as quote unquote isolationism. So the irreconcilables, you know, America should avoid, avoid all foreign entanglements, whereas the reservationists tended to come from the more like Teddy Roosevelt imperialist wing of the party, that America should have a powerful and muscular foreign policy, but we are engaging the world on our own terms. So Henry Cabot Lodge, the Senate Majority Leader, came up with 14 reservations, which I find funny. I could imagine them like, hey, we've got 12, we need two more. So they wanted 14. Now, Wilson has a chance to be like Jefferson and, I mean, like Madison and Hamilton and compromise and get the treaty passed. But even when Europe, okay, so is Wilson going to compromise and pass the treaty or stand his ground and fail? And so Europe to the United States says, we're okay with the reservations, go for it. But Wilson said the Senate must take its medicine. Now, the thing is, the Senate, though, I mean, Wilson's trying to be all democratic, goes on this speaking tour where he has a stroke, okay? He goes all around the country, even targeting um, some senators that are in vulnerable areas. So he's like, I'm going to do a speaking tour. He has a stroke. That doesn't end up working so well. So what happens here is that Wilson does not compromise with the reservationist. He tells his own people <clears throat> to vote against the treaty with the Lodge reservations. And so the irreconcilables and the internationalists vote against it and it fails, okay? No Henry Clay was there for a compromise and the United States never joined the League of Nations. Now Woodrow Wilson did get a Nobel Peace Prize, but the United States did not jo ever join the League of Nations. All right, so ladies and gentlemen, like I said, nobody asked about that one, but that's something that is very, very important, okay? Very, very important there to make sure that you understand the Versailles Treaty controversy. There's been a DBQ on that one in the past. Uh, thank you all so much for coming tonight, and it is always a pleasure.